All right, folks, let's uh, get started. Uh, first of all, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, Introduction to Amazon uh, Web Services. So uh, my name is uh, Savitra Sirvi, and uh, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And uh, but you know, I've also been using uh, AWS for about uh, eight years now. And uh, I'm a solutions architect as well. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about uh, how I've used uh, Amazon Web Services. So for about four to five years, I was involved with a software as a, uh, as a service uh, business, uh, right? And this was a startup. And um, as in, this, in this role, uh, I had to be involved on the technical side uh, with a young team. So I was involved in architecting, building it, uh, coaching a team as well. Uh, and also on the sales side, uh, I had to communicate uh, cloud computing, software as a service uh, as an idea to audiences which were not very familiar with these uh, with these concepts. Okay. And uh, in a subsequent role, uh, I was involved in uh, cost optimization of AWS. And this was for a large uh, technology product. All right. So um, today what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to introduce you to AWS, but I will not show you any slides, uh, no presentation. Uh, this is going to be a demonstration only. All right. And there's a bunch of services that AWS offers, but um, I will focus on maybe two or three uh, key services. So let me just show you. Let's uh, let's get started, right? Uh, let me show you this uh, this screen. I hope you can uh, see the uh, web console, the AWS web console. Uh, and my demonstrations are going to be mostly on uh, on this uh, on this console. All right. So this is what you will see if you create uh, an AWS account. Right, and as soon as you log in, uh, this is the dashboard that you will you will see. Um, I hope you can see my terminal window as well. Uh, I might I might use this a little bit just to show you how to connect to certain uh, AWS resources. So AWS has uh, a number of services, right? As you can see on your screen, uh, there's stuff in the compute category, right? Right here on the top left. Uh, there are services for storage, uh, databases. Security and identity, especially identity and access management. Uh, there's also new stuff uh, in analytics and big data, right? And uh, mobile services as well. All right, so there's a number of services. Uh, this was not always the always the case, uh, right? So uh, initially, AWS was uh, a very simple infrastructure as a service, and uh, they've been adding new services all the time, right? So now it is it is a very comprehensive. Uh, a comprehensive service. All right, uh, but today I'm going to talk about maybe three things. So one is EC2. This is a simple virtual virtual servers, right? It's a, a core service, uh, a simple infrastructural element. All right, so I'll show you how to set up a virtual server, uh, um, maybe install how to install your application, right? Um, this service also has uh, things like load balancers and auto scaling. Uh, groups, right? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, about these things. I'll also talk about S3. So this is an important storage service, right? So uh, very large, no num no limits on uh, what you can store, uh, right? Highly durable, very fast, right? So this is a very good service for things like uh, setting up websites, uh, storing your database uh, backups, log files, video files, anything really. And uh, lastly, I'll try and show you RDS as well. So this is a relational database service. Uh, it helps you run your MySQL databases, for instance, right? But you can also do Oracle, uh, Microsoft SQL, all right? And what it, what it does for you is uh, things like uh, backup, uh, database replication, stuff like that. So it makes database management very easy, all right? So let's uh, get started. First, I'm going to talk about EC2. So EC2 is Elastic Cloud Compute, right? So it's uh, um, essentially very flexible uh, sort of service where you can uh, launch servers, right? And they can be of different sizes, and uh, it's very very simple. Let's let's see how to launch uh, launch an instance. Uh, by the way, I also want to point out, right? I am uh, in a region uh, called US East. So these are this list that you see on the top right of the screen um, are regions. Uh, in AWS uh, terminology. These are uh, essentially the geographical uh, locations where the infrastructure will be located. All right. And normally you want to pick a region uh, which is close to where your uh, users are. This way you can avoid 
uh, network latency uh, problems. All right, and uh, within a region, you also have uh, what is called availability zones. So these are sort of uh, you know independent independent uh, units within a region. All right, and uh, when I say independent, I mean uh, their power supply may be independent, right? Or their uh, networking may be independent. So, um, so if there's a problem with with uh, a power supplier, uh, it's likely that only one availability zone will be affected. All right. So, uh, what you want to do is uh, when you create infrastructure, you want to create them in multiple zones within a region. Uh, this way, you'll have higher availability. All right. So, let me show you how to launch uh, a simple virtual server. I'm going to click on launch. The first step is to select uh, what is called armies, right? So this is an Amazon machine image. It's basically a bundle of uh, operating system as well as uh, software packages, right? So uh, you could have, say, an Ubuntu, for example, right here. I'm going to select Ubuntu. All right, and it's also possible to have armies uh, with certain software installed, pre-installed. So uh, if you're a LAMP person, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP, right? So it's possible to have armies which have those software packages installed already, right? So, th so that you don't have to do it uh, every time you launch uh, a server. It's also possible to uh, create an army of your application. So, you know, build a server completely, including uh, OS, software packages, your application, uh, all the configuration that is required to run your application, right? And then convert that into an army, all right? So this way, uh, you just build a server once, and then you can launch uh, as many servers as you like, as many times as you like uh, from that uh, from that army. All right, so I'm gonna select uh, Ubuntu here for the moment. All right, uh, this is instance types. This is second step. So uh, you have uh, different sizes of servers, right? So from very, very small, like this one is a micro instance. Uh, it has uh, one CPU and about 600 MBs of uh, RAM, all right? Uh, but you can have very large servers as well, depending on your need, all right? So for example, this one here, uh, 8x large is uh, 32 uh, CPUs and 60 GBs of, uh, GBs of RAM. All right, so for the moment, let's uh, let's select uh, micro instance. Um, I also want to point out uh, there's something called free tier, right? So if you're uh, creating a new AWS account, uh, a bunch of services are available in the free tier. So uh, you'll not be billed for using these, uh, right? For a whole year. So uh, so this way, uh, you can uh, open your account and uh, give AWS a try uh, without uh, without any uh, cost. All right, so we've selected a micro instance. Right, I'm not going to go into too much detail at this time. I'm going to leave this uh, alone. All right, uh, one important step is uh, adding storage. Right, so this is essentially like uh, your hard disks uh, in a in a server. Right, so this is uh, this is a root volume, uh, which has the operating system essentially. Right, but you could add more volumes as well. So you could have uh, one root volume and then perhaps one more. Uh, as a data uh, volume, All right? But for the moment, uh, let's stick to stick to uh, one volume. Now, one more important thing is security group. So this is uh, this is very similar to I mean this is essentially a firewall, right? So each component that you create in AWS uh, has its own firewall, right? So this is, a, it's a, this is great from a security uh, point of view. So let me create a new security group. Let's call it uh, web server security group, all right? And uh, you can see here there are some rules. So this is SSH, right? So you can connect to this server on SSH on port 22. Uh, normally what you want to do is, uh, you know, restrict the source, right? So we don't want uh, people to connect to the server over SSH. So I'm going to say my IP. Uh, but since this is a web a web server, uh, we also want to allow traffic on HTTP, all right? And normally HTTP is uh, would would have source set to anywhere, all right? Because you want anybody in the world uh, to access your web server. All right, so that's it. Uh, let's uh, review uh, what we're doing. So we're going to launch a server, uh, which is an Ubuntu machine, all right, uh, with uh, 
Ubuntu Trusty. This is uh, the the version of Ubuntu, all right. And uh, this is a T1 Micro, a very tiny server, uh, which is great for uh, test purposes um, and certain kinds of uh, all kinds of uh, needs, uh, really, right? So, for example, if you have a controller um, uh, that you want to run. Uh, you may want to run several web servers uh, behind a load balancer, right? So in that case, uh, uh, micro instances can be great as well. All right, uh, we have a security group which allows SSH access on a single IP address, right? Which is my my computer, uh, and it also allows access on port 80 uh, from anywhere, All right? And as far as the storage is concerned, we have uh, one volume uh, of size 8G. All right, so this is it. Uh, you can see there's there's a lot of flexibility, right? You can change things. You can change instance type. You can change firewall rules. Uh, you can add more volumes. All right. So let's uh, go ahead and uh, launch this. All right. One more thing is uh, before you uh, launch the server, you need to uh, select a key pair. Right? So this is uh, your uh, public and private key pair, right? This is what you use to connect to the server uh, using uh, using SSH. All right. So this is a good practice. Uh, you always uh, should use key pairs uh, and not use passwords, right? So uh, if you want to use passwords alone, you can do that, right? But I think in most cases you would you would not do that. All right. So I'm going to select uh, an existing key pair that I have and uh, launch this particular instance. All right. So that's it. Uh, let's uh, take a look at this. All right, so while this is coming up, uh, this may take maybe a minute, right, to, to sort of uh, boot itself up. And uh, if you uh, look at the bottom half of the screen, you can see things like uh, the instance type right here. It's a micro instance. Um, there's a security group, right? You can see the rules here, the firewall. And uh, it's in a certain zone, right? So it's in 1C. Uh, this can be important. We'll see. We'll see how this becomes important. And also, there's a public IP address, right? So there's a public IP address, which means we can connect to the server uh, from the internet, from the outside. All right. Uh, you can also use the public DNS, which is essentially the same thing as a public IP address. All right. So I think the server is in a running state. Let's try and connect to this. So normally, what you would do is uh, you would connect to the server like this, right? So uh, this is a standard SSH connection. So I specify the uh, my my private key and uh, the user to connect to the server is Ubuntu, and then I provide the IP address. All right, so that's it. So you know we've we've sort of connected over SSH uh, to the EC2 instance we just started, right? And uh, now we are in the server. Uh, and uh, we can run some commands. So, for example, uh, if you want to install some packages, you would you would do something like apt get to update the package list. All right. So anyway, so you know this is how you sort of uh, use the server, right? Uh, this is standard uh, Linux uh, commands uh, that you can that you can run on the server. All right. So let me exit this. Okay, so just to summarize, right? What we've seen is uh, we launched an EC2 instance. Uh, this is uh, a virtual server, and uh, we sort of uh, selected an army, right? Uh, which is uh, which is uh, which was an Ubuntu army, and uh, we specified a micro instance, right? It's a very small uh, instance with about 600 MBs of RAM. Uh, we specified some firewall uh, rules. Uh, we set up a volume, EBS volume. Uh, we set up a key pair to connect to the server, right? And uh, in a minute or two, you have you have a server uh, that is running, right? So this is uh, essentially uh, EC2 for you. Uh, but you know that's not all, right? Uh, this is uh, this is this just one VP, uh, one uh, sort of uh, uh, virtual server. Okay. So uh, you know this is not the only thing you can do with EC2, right? Uh, this is just one server. What you would normally do, especially in production environments, is uh, is uh, you could you could run servers behind a load balancer, right? So what you would do is uh, 
let's take a look at this, right? So this is a load balancer. Uh, what you would do is, uh, it's very simple, very, very simple to create one. All right, so, uh, so we're going to load, uh, do the load balancing across port 80, right? You can, of course, do it on other things as well. Uh, for example, it's very common to do a load balancing on, on uh, port 443 HTTPS. All right, and um, you can also have uh, security settings for, uh, for the load balancer. And uh, we also need to set up the health check. So what a load balancer can do is it can, it can sort of uh, ping your uh, EC2 servers. And uh, if uh, some of them or one of them is not responding, it will stop sending traffic to it. All right, so this is what a health check is. And then you can simply uh, specify the uh, sort of uh, EC2 instances that you want behind this uh, behind this load balancer. All right. So a load balancer essentially is uh, it can distribute load across multiple servers, right? And why you want to do this is uh, um, more servers will give you scalability, right? They'll give you better performance. Uh, they'll also give you high availability. Uh, because if one server goes down, the other servers can continue. Right? So you have higher availability. And you can also create servers in multiple availability zones. Right? And uh, like I said before, a zone is uh, independent of each other, right? of the other zones. So uh, if there's any problem with power or uh, uh, internet connections or any sort of problem, uh, it's likely that only one zone will be impacted. So what you normally do is create EC2 instances in uh, multiple zones and then use a load balancer to distribute traffic among all your instances. All right, so this is how you create an ELB. And uh, you can see it's, it's uh, just a five minute, uh, five minute uh, job to get this going. All right, and uh, what happens is uh, in an ELB, you don't use IP addresses, right? In, in EC2, uh, you saw that we used an IP address to connect to it. Uh, but in a load balancer, you have uh, DNS names, so something like this. All right, and what you would do is you would point your DNS record, your domain name, uh, yourcompany.com, let us say, right? So you would create a DNS mapping, uh, mapping your domain name to this uh, DNS name here. Right, so this is how you would get that working. So let, let me just show you guys how what this might look like. Uh, so you can see here, this is a, a actual, uh, you know, a functioning load balancer, right? And uh, this is sending traffic to an EC2 instance uh, that has uh, Apache Web Server uh, installed on it. All right, so this is a quick introduction to load balancers. Now, a really cool uh, feature of EC2 is uh, uh, is auto scaling. All right, so I'm not going to show you this uh, right now, uh, but uh, let me just tell you briefly what this is. So essentially what you can do is you can create a, uh, a fleet of EC2 servers, right? So this is uh, a group of servers. Uh, you specify a minimum and a maximum, right? And then you can uh, set up some rules uh, for the number of servers to increase or de decrease, right? So say something like uh, if the average CPU utilization of the auto scaling group uh, goes above 90%, right, for say 10 minutes. Uh, that means uh, the infrastructure is overloaded, right? So what you could do is, uh, you, the, the rule could say, let's add a couple of uh, more servers, all right? And you can have a corresponding rule to decrease the number of servers as well. So uh, you could set up a rule that says, uh, if the average CPU utilization goes below 40% for say 10 minutes, right, uh, then remove a couple of servers, right? So this gives you, uh, fantastic uh, uh, performance, right? So your your uh, capacity moves with the uh, demand, uh, and uh, the other the flip side is uh, it also uh, the capacity reduces, right? When when the load is less, so this saves you cost, right? So this saves you cost uh, because uh, you might know this, right? You you probably know this uh, in AWS and other cloud computing platforms, you are uh, built on a on an uh, early basis, right? So, so for EC2, you are billed uh, uh, per instance R, right? So if you have instances not running, uh, you can save a significant amount of uh, amount of money. All right. So that's my introduction to EC2. 
let me move on to something else. Okay, so let's talk about S3. So this is in the storage and content delivery category, all right? Um, and the full form is uh, simple storage service. So S3 is uh, uh, highly durable, right? So the uh, durability SLA offered by AWS is 99.99s, uh, uh, all right? So the uh, chances of you losing any file or any sort of data is uh, next to uh, next to nothing. All right, so it's a highly durable service. Uh, you can store anything, right? You can you can store images, video files, log files, database files. Um, you can set up a website using S3, right? And it's very very cheap as well, uh, very cheap. So how this works is uh, you simply create a bucket. All right, and. Uh, So a bucket is simply a uh, way of organizing your content, uh, right? So it's just a uh, just a uh, just a bucket, right? And within a bucket, you could uh, create folders as well, right? So um, all right. So um, so this is what you can do, and then uh, you can upload uh, any sort of content, right? So All right, so let me just upload this file. It doesn't matter. All right, so you can upload any sort of file. All right, uh, you can also uh, use uh, automated scripts. Right, so uh, what you're seeing, what you've seen so far, is the web console. Right, so this is a web console uh, that AWS offers for you to sort of manage your infrastructure. Uh, but there are also a command line uh, toolkits and software development kits available, right? So you could uh, write programs and uh, shell scripts uh, to, to sort of interact with the AWS infrastructure, right? So for example, um, you know, let me, let me sort of sh show you how to upload a file to this, uh, to this bucket, right? So let's, uh, uh, let me just create a file, all right? And uh, let's say you wanted to upload this uh, to uh, to the bucket, right? So you could do something like this. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to uh, move a file, uh, a demo S3 file, uh, from my uh, computer right to this uh, to this bucket that we just created all right so looks like that's done uh, you can also uh, do an ls uh, which is you know a, a linux command for listing stuff right so uh, you could do something like this as well All right, so you can see here it shows you the contents of that uh, of that bucket, right? So uh, using commands such as these, you can write uh, shell scripts, right? So typically, what you would do is you would write a shell script to uh, move your database backup files into S3, right? So a nightly uh, script, perhaps running in a cron, uh, which moves a database backup uh, into into S3. All right. Um, but there's a bunch of other things as well uh, that you can do with S3. For instance, uh, let's look at the properties of this uh, of this bucket. All right, and what you can do is uh, you can set up lifecycle rules. By the way, you can also turn on versioning, which means it will maintain all versions of of a certain file. Right, so this is very useful. Uh, for example, if something goes uh, goes wrong, All right? But what I want to show you is uh, life cycles. So uh, what you could do is uh, configure a rule, all right, that says, um, say after 30 days, uh, move my files into another storage class within S3, right? So S3 is, uh, is great, it's fast, it's highly durable, uh, but there are cheaper storage options as well. All right, so one of the options is uh, infrequent access. All right, so this is cheaper 
all right but the assumption is you won't be uh, retrieving these objects too frequently all right so we have set up a rule which says uh, move a file uh, from s3 standard to infrequent access storage class after 30 days all right and you can also say that uh, after 60 days uh, move the file to glacier now glacier is fantastic by the way it's uh, it's the cheapest option right uh, very very cheap uh, storage option uh, great for uh, say archives right things that you uh, want to store you need to store um, for example in a bank uh, right uh, the regulators uh, demand that data be kept for several years I think in India it's, uh, it's seven years uh, right so uh, so most of this data is there for many years but it's hardly ever uh, re retrieved right so what you're looking for is a very cheap storage class and uh, and, and that option is, uh, is place here so what we're doing here is after 60 days when the odds of needing uh, a particular file is uh, is very low uh, we move the uh, the file to place here all right and of course you can also uh, delete the file uh, let's say after after a year all right so so that's the rule that we have created right and you can see the administration is very easy now right you just let's say you're doing this for your uh, log files or your database files uh, simply set up a script to move the files into S3 and S3 will manage uh, the movement of the file from standard to infrequent access and then to place here. Right? So it's very, very simple uh, to use S3. All right, so, so that's S3. Now let me show you one more thing and then uh, we can move on to uh, questions. All right, so, so the third thing I'm going to show you is RDS, Relational Database Service. All right, so this is uh, a managed service, um, and what this means is uh, it does some things for you, right? So it does uh, database backups, for example. Uh, it does, it can do database uh, replication for you. All right. Now uh, you should know that you could set up database on EC2 servers as well, right? So you uh, you can take a virtual server on EC2 and install your MySQL server on that, right? You could do that, and it would be cheaper that way. But uh, if you're looking for, uh, I mean, if you've been on the database side, right, uh, you would know that uh, managing backups is a is a is a headache, right? It's uh, it's complex, um, and uh, things like replication, right, database replication, setting up master-slave configurations, uh, making sure they are functioning well, uh, those things are hard things to do, right? So. Uh, if you don't have the expertise, right, or uh, if you rather not do those things, right, let's say you're a developer, you probably want to focus on your uh, on your application, right. So uh, for those sorts of needs, RDS is uh, RDS is fantastic. So let me just show you uh, how to do this. So I'm going to launch a database instance, right. And you can see here there are multiple engines available, right? So you might prefer, uh, I mean, if you're a startup, perhaps you're using uh, MySQL or uh, PostgreSQL, right? Uh, but if you are on the enterprise side, perhaps you need to use uh, Oracle or SQL Server, right? So whatever your database engine, uh, you can uh, you can sort of use that here. So I'm going to use uh, MySQL, and uh, there's a couple of options here. Um, so one is you install MySQL. As a, on a single server, right? That's uh, that's something that you would do for a development environment or a test environment. Uh, but you can also set up a multi AZ uh, deployment, right? So this is a multi availability zone deployment, and essentially means uh, there's a master and a slave, right? So there's a primary database and there's a uh, there's a, a slave database which is which is uh, a replication, right? And um, what's important is this is multiple availability zones, right? Uh, and this this gives you high availability, right? So if there's a problem in a zone, um, the RDS will switch you automatically uh, within a few seconds, right? Or or maybe a couple of minutes at the at the most uh, to the secondary database, right? So you have you have high availability that way, all right? So for now, I'm just going to select uh, the single. Uh, instance, right? Assuming this is a development or a test environment. 
All right. And uh, what you do is, uh, again, it's very similar to EC2, right? So you select your instance type, size of your server. Uh, this, this you will know. Uh, if you know your application, you'll probably know what you need, right? And even if you don't, even if you don't know how much is needed, you can start with, start small, right? And uh, you can change very easily. Right? So this is a great thing about cloud computing in AWS, right? You can, um, um, if you change your mind, if you need to change your mind, you can you can do that uh, with just a few clicks of your uh, of your mouse. So I'm going to select micro. Uh, I'm going to select um, no to multi AZ, right? This would be yes if this was uh, this were a production environment uh, with, with high availability needs, right? And you can also select the uh, storage. So this is essentially the uh, storage for your database, right? So you'll know how much uh, storage you need. For your for your uh, database and and your application, right? And normally you can start small, and uh, again uh, this can be changed very easily, right? So you should you would monitor this, and uh, if it's approaching say 80% of uh, utilization, you can simply uh, simply change or or increase the uh, allocated storage, right? Um, and you don't want to have too much. Uh, initially, because you're built by the uh, amount of storage you use, right? So, so the billing in the case of storage is uh, something like GB months, right? So, the more GBs you allocate, the more you will be billed. So, it, it makes sense to sort of keep this um, to the minimum that you need. All right, and I'm going to just set up some uh, some uh, settings here. So, uh, the identifier of the instance. So, this is the sort of identifier of the server. And uh, a root uh, username and password as well. All right, um, I'm going to leave this uh, these details for now. Uh, let's look at something something here. So the thing that RDS does for you, right, that you that you uh, that EC2 cannot do for you is uh, it it does an automatic backup of your database, a, a nightly backup, right? And you can specify the retention period, how long these backups will be stored. All right, and these backups also allow for point-in-time recovery. So let's say you apply a, a change to your application and something something goes horribly wrong, right? Uh, and you want to go back two hours from now. So you could do that uh, because because of these backups, right? So RDS maintains a backup file, the, the nightly backup, and it also maintains transaction logs, right? So it has uh, it can do point-in-time recovery for you. All right, and it also applies patches for you, right? So this is something that is also painful, right? Uh, to apply uh, security patches and other types of patches to your uh, database uh, server, right? So this is something that RDS can uh, can do for you automatically. All right, so that's it. Uh, it's as simple as that. All right, so this this takes a bit of time, uh, perhaps about five minutes or so. All right, and let me show you how to connect to this, right? So once this comes up, I have a running server here. Let me show you how to connect to this. So each uh, RDS instance will have uh, what is called an endpoint, right? So this is uh, this is the endpoint, right? All right, so what you do is, uh, let's say you want to connect to this uh, database instance. So uh, you will connect to this, you know, the, the way you connect to, a, to any MySQL server, right? Except um, you will specify the host option right so so you need to specify the host option and there you will uh, you will specify the endpoint for that particular RDS instance All right and uh, then the port this is standard uh, mysql connection uh, right so this is the port 3306 and then uh, you specify the username and then the uh, the password All right, so you can see you can connect to a uh, to a MySQL server this way, right? And these same credentials, uh, you can create more MySQL users, and then uh, and then sort of use those uh, those credentials in this host uh, endpoint, right, in your application as well. So run your application on EC2 instances, and uh, in those instances configure the RDS uh, host name, right, and username and password. So that way you make EC2 and RDS work together. All right, and you run your regular MySQL commands uh, that you are that you are used to. All right, so that's it. I mean, that's all I wanted to show you. Uh, this is a very quick introduction to 
uh, some of the core services that AWS offers, right? So EC2 is uh, virtual servers. Uh, S3 is uh, highly scalable, highly durable, uh, general purpose uh, storage, right? And RDS is a managed uh, relational database service, all right? So now let me look at uh, some of your questions. All right, so, um, okay, so Don, your question is, how do you remove the server instance so you don't get billed after 12 uh, months? All right, so look, what you do is uh, you go to EC2, right? You have the server uh, that's running here. All right, and by the way, you don't need to wait for 12 months, right? You don't even have to wait for five minutes. So that's the great thing about cloud computing. It's uh, completely, um, you know, there's no there's no upfront commitment, right? So you can uh, use a server for uh, for five minutes as well, right? So what you do simply is go here and terminate, right? As simple as that. So uh, it's built on an hourly basis. So um, uh, right. So so if you use it for one hour or less, right? You'll have uh, you have a very small uh, hourly cost. A few cents per hour is is, is how uh, how it works you know, is what a micro instance would cost, all right? So there's no need to use it for 12 months. Uh, there is something called a reserved instance, right? So if you know that you, you're going to use certain capacity for a long time, uh, then you can reserve some capacity for 12 months or more, right? And what you get is a very uh, significant discount. So something like 60% uh, discount you could get uh, if you commit to using capacity for 12 months or more, all right? But otherwise, uh, the normal instances are called on-demand instances, and you can just set them up and, and sort of terminate them uh, whenever you're done with them. All right, uh, the next question is from Sri Ram, and what you're asking is, uh, does AWS support application servers where applications can reside on the cloud? Yeah, so, you know, uh, these EC2 servers that you're seeing, right, uh, these, are, uh, these are essentially virtual servers. You can install anything on them. Uh, whatever you can do in your own servers, you can do on EC2, right? So uh, you could install an application, uh, you could have another layer with web servers, right? You could use RDS for databases. So whatever you, you can do outside of AWS and cloud computing, uh, you, can, uh, you can do on AWS. There's no problem at all. All right, uh, Gokul, your question is, what is a load balancer? All right, so this is, a, you know, a load balancer is a component, uh, right? And uh, what, what happens is, uh, you have, uh, when you have uh, users coming to your site, right, they will hit the load balancer, all right? And uh, the load balancer's job is to uh, distribute traffic uh, among, among the various EC2 instances or virtual servers running behind the load balancer, right? So if you have 10 servers, right, the load balancer will distribute traffic uh, to those 10 servers. All right, and the reason you want to have a load balancer is, uh, you know, multiple servers uh, can give you better performance. Uh, it can give you higher availability, right? So if one server goes down, uh, there are nine other servers that are available, right? So your user does not see uh, see the see the difference, right? So multiple servers is good. Uh, it also gives you horizontal scalability, right? So if you need, if your usage is, uh, is higher, uh, right, uh, you need to add more servers. So that's called horizontal scalability. So instead of 10 servers, you could go to 20 servers, right? And, uh, and when you have this many servers, you need to have a load balancer because there needs to be certain component which will, which will sort of uh, distribute the traffic, all right? So this is, by the way, you know, not an AWS feature, right? So th these are things which are, uh, which are done outside of cloud computing as well, uh, right? But, uh, but you can see AWS provides that as well. All right, uh, Gokul, your question is, what's the difference between S3 storage and uh, databases? Yeah, so so databases are, you know, uh, like relational databases, right? They are structured, uh, you normally do it, use them for structured data, like say employee records, right, or customer records. Uh, whereas S3 is more like a file, it's actually called an object storage, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a file storage, although you would commonly use it to store your files, right? So it's an object storage uh, where you can have uh, very large sized files, say I think the maximum limit is five terabytes, right? And you can have any number of files and they're kept very, very safely, 
Right? So, for example, you know, if you, if you have a YouTube-like application, right, you'll have a relational database for, say, user accounts, right? But the videos would be stored in S3. All right. So your data would be stored in a in a database, and your videos would be stored in S3. So that's how that's how you would uh, use these uh, various services. Often you need to use both. All right. So Lakshmi, uh, your question is, uh, uh, how is S3 available on your computer, right? So you're you're referring to these commands here, right? So you're referring to these commands here. So how is uh, this available on your computer? Did you mount anything uh, on your computer? Yeah, so this is a good question, right? So what you need to do is you need to install a small uh, utility. Uh, it's called AWS CLI. All right, so it's just a, a command line toolkit uh, made available. It's free of cost. It's made available by AWS. Right, so you install it. It's a very simple installation, and uh, you configure your credentials. Right, so you need to have uh, you need to have credentials. So, so these are like long uh, long strings of um, essentially keys, right? Secret keys. So these are available on, in your account, uh, and and those credentials have to be configured in the command line toolkit. And once you do that, you you can then sort of run these commands. All right. And the same thing, you know, if you want to uh, manage your infrastructure using scripts, you can also install this command line toolkit on your servers, uh, which will which will uh, where you will run your scripts. Right. So they, these can be installed uh, on any sort of uh, uh, computer, whether it's a client or a server. All right. Uh, one more question here from um, Weaver. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm uh, not pronouncing it right. Uh, but your question is, um, if if you have cause to uh, move the files earlier to to any of the cheaper storage, like infrequent access or glacier, uh, will you get billed for accessing them before 30 or 60 days? All right. So oh, okay. So I think I understand what you're saying is, uh, if you need uh, if you need to access uh, the files that have been moved to Glacier, let's say, right? Uh, if you need to access them uh, before 30 days, right? Uh, will you will you be built? Yeah. So you know, uh, our lifecycle rules were such that you know they were moved into uh, cheaper storage classes after 30 days and 60 days, right? So if you need those files before 30 days, then you'll be fetching them from S3. Right, and there are some some costs. You know, there are uh, with the S3, there may be some storage costs, there may be some network cost. So those costs will apply, right? Whatever the S3 costs are, uh, those will uh, those will uh, apply. All right, and but even after they move to say infrequent access or glacier, you can still access them. All right, you can still access them. Uh, for example, with glacier, you you have certain sort of uh, commands that you can use to get your files back, right, to your server. But what happens is glacier is typically slower. To, to uh, retrieve. So it can take up to four hours, for example, for you to get a file. Right? So that's the trade-off. You get cheaper storage, but, but uh, the retrieval becomes slower. All right, so I hope I answered your question. Uh, but basically, you know, if you're accessing them before 30 days or 60 days, um, you will access them from, from that particular storage class in which it is stored, right? not, not in any other storage class. All right, uh, Gokul, your question is how do we install R software in EC2? Yeah, so R, you know, I'm not very familiar with it, right? If if you can install R on, say, a Windows server or a Linux server, right, in your in your own premises, in your own server room, in your own data center, in your own laptop, right? If you can do those things, then you can do that on EC2 as well, right? Because you simply, you know, you simply connect to EC2. Uh, the way I had showed, right? You you use SSH, connect to EC2, and then download uh, the R software and run the installation command. So the same thing that you do outside of cloud computing, you can uh, you can do on EC2. All right, uh, Sriram, your question is: Is there any support for a continuous build and integration? Yeah. So this is also a good question. So look, um, what AWS is doing is it's uh, always expanding its list of services, right? Um, and uh, it was, it used to be an infrastructure as a service, very simple uh, storage, networking, compute capacity, right? But now it is adding more and more services. So, for example, uh, there's something called OpsWorks, right? So, if you're familiar with Chef or Puppet, uh, right? These are configuration management tools. Uh, this is something that you can uh, you can look at, all right? Uh, there are other services as well. For example, Elastic Beanstalk. So, this makes it very easy for you to uh, deploy your application. So all you have to do is uh, create your application, and with a few 
steps, right? Uh, the the servers, the application will be deployed on servers. Uh, even if even if the servers are load balanced and have auto scaling and complex uh, uh, infrastructural elements, right? Uh, elastic load balance, uh, elastic beanstalk will do that on your behalf, right? So as a developer, you simply upload your code and the infrastructure is created by beanstalk for you, right? And Beanstalk also makes it very easy to deploy changes to your application, right? So your version two or version three uh, can be deployed to your servers with just a you know one or two clicks of your uh, of your mouse, All right? So there are multiple sources, uh, multiple services. Even cloud formation is another one that you might want to look at, right? So this is something that allows you to create uh, uh, infrastructure using uh, template files, right? So very simple JSON-like template files can be used to uh, codify your infrastructure and uh, simply supply the template to create the infrastructure. Right? So some of these services I think you'll have to sort of evaluate uh, to see if these uh, meet your needs. All right, uh, Tarun, your question is does it provide disaster uh, recovery? Right, so yes, this might be an old question, I'm not sure what you're referring to, uh, but in general, right, uh, AWS is very good for disaster recovery. So uh, for example, you have multi-AZ deployments. Right, so multi, uh, multiple availability zones uh, give you very high availability. And uh, with RTS, you could do uh, master-slave replication. Right? So if there's a disaster in, in one zone, the, uh, the slave becomes the primary database. Right? Uh, with, on the EC2 side, you can have load balancer and have EC2 instances in multiple zones. Right? So this way, if there's a disaster, uh, one zone keeps functioning. All right? And you can also do a cross-regional uh, sort of uh, disaster recovery, right? So you could copy your armies and uh, database snapshots to another region, right? Um, and if there's a problem in, in your primary region, you could sort of quickly uh, provision infrastructure in the secondary region, right? And there's also uh, Route 53 here. So this is a networking service, essentially a DNS uh, service. So you could do things like latency-based routing, uh, which which is like an active active disaster recovery configuration, right? You could do DNS failover as well. So so this is uh, pretty good as well. All right, uh, Gaurav, your question is: uh, Can I suspend an instance so that I don't get billed till the time I I need it again? Yeah, so good question. So you could you could you know what you could do for example is uh, you have a server here, right? Uh, you could stop it instead of terminating it. So so right here instance state and stop, right? So this this uh, puts the machine in a sleep state and you're not built for using the server, right? But you are built for the storage that may be attached to the server, right? Which is normally storage is a very small component of your build, all right? So this is something that you could do. Or you could sort of take a snapshot, right? You can take a snapshot of your volume, all right? So you can just take a copy of this volume all right, and when you need, and, and then terminate the server, right? And when you need it again, from this snapshot, you can sort of create uh, create a new server, right? So there are multiple multiple options. Uh, it's very very easy to do uh, what you're what you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, all right. So okay, Ajita, your question is how how will licensing work for operating system and databases? Yeah. So this is also a good question. So normally, you know, you could of course use things like MySQL or uh, Linux, right? And the, the the hourly rate that you pay uh, is, is you know essentially includes the, the server cost, the cost of running the server, right? Uh, but for certain um, commercial products like uh, Oracle databases, right, the cost of licensing is built into your hourly rate, okay? Or, or perhaps a Windows server on the EC2 side, uh, you would find that the cost, the hourly cost, is slightly higher, and that's because of the licensing cost. All right, and there are some options for bringing your existing licenses as well. All right, so you might have invested as an enterprise into Oracle licenses, right? And you don't want to waste those licenses, so you can talk to AWS and sort of uh, bring them over into AWS. All right, and uh, Lakshmi, your question is how uh, how is high availability possible with EC2? Yeah. So, you know, first of all, EC2 itself is highly available, right? So it has, I think, a SLA of 99.95%, uh, right? Um, and uh, what you can do is you can create multiple EC2 instances, right? So that gives you higher availability. Uh, you can create auto-scaling groups. Uh, these are uh, 
groups where if there's a hardware failure, the auto scaling group will automatically replace it with a new one. All right. And you can also sort of set up EC2 instances in multiple zones uh, so that if there's a zonal failure, failure as well, uh, your, uh, your application will keep running. Okay. And there are complex configurations where you can create cross region uh, infrastructure as well. All right. So basically, there's several options. You know, there's load balancers, there's auto scaling groups, there are zones, there are regions. Uh, there's a route 53 for DNS fail, failover, lots of things you can do. And if you look at the architecture white papers on AWS, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of ideas. All right, Tarun, uh, uh, once again, good question. Do the applications need to be developed in a different way in order to be deployed on the cloud? So no, you know, they, what you can do, right, if you're building an application from scratch, right, uh, you can take advantage of the uh, capabilities of cloud. Right, so you can design your applications in a new way, uh, which is which is better. All right. So, for example, uh, because cloud infrastructure is, is uh, uh, you can throw them away, right? So, what you normally would want to do is store sessions in a NoSQL database, for example, right, or in a cache uh, cache server. Right, you won't store sessions in a uh, on the on the EC2 instance that you're uh, that you run, right? So, there are a lot of things that you can change in your architecture to take advantage of the cloud. But if you already have an application, right, which runs on your own existing servers, right, so uh, you don't need to make any change. Right? You can simply move them over, uh, provided all the services that you need, right, are available in the in the AWS. Right? So, so yes and no, essentially, right. And existing applications you, you move uh, right away and then look to optimize later. But new applications you can you can sort of build them. All right, uh, there's one question here from Spyros. Uh, how does the file synchronization occur between a client workstation and a EC2 file server on AWS with S3 storage? All right, so, you know, first of all, EC2 instances uh, don't use S3, right? So there's, I mean, you can create applications which use both, right? So your application will run on EC2 and you can have certain files on S3. You could do that, but uh, otherwise S3 and EC2 are not sort of integrated in any way, right? So these are completely separate services. Uh, what you have normally is with EC2, you have uh, EPS volumes, Elast Block Store, right? So, they, so the volume that you see here um, is actually an EPS volume, and this is sort of linked to, attached to a to a uh, EC2 server, right? So EPS is like, like your NAS, right? Or NAS or SAN. Um, so this is what uh, normally happens. And uh, as far as synchronization is, is uh, concerned, um, you know, there's no synchronization as such, right? You can build something if you want to, but there's no synchronization between a client and, and, uh, and EBS uh, storage, all right? With S3, what you can do is you could sort of uh, set up some sort of synchronization. Right? You could sort of, uh, um, for example, if you're copying your log files, right, uh, from a local server to S3, you could sort of set up a synchronization with a command. So you, you run a command called sync, and then it, it sort of uh, makes sure that the files are the same on both sides. Right? So you could do that with S3 alone. Um, and EC2 is a different thing. It's a, it's sort of a virtual server. And uh, Ramesh, uh, how is AWS load balancer different from other load balancers, say F5? So you know I don't think it's very different in terms of functionality. Right? It does the same job, essentially load balancing, distributing traffic. Right? Uh, it does a health check. I don't know if F5 can do a health check, uh, right? So if instances are not healthy, it doesn't send traffic um, uh, to those uh, to those servers, right? And um, it's designed to work within a region, but across uh, multiple uh, zones, right? So that's that's how it works. But functionally, I think it's very similar to uh, other load balancers. All right. So there's one question here from Dohun. Uh, you're asking, do we need to make one or more uh, server for load balancer, or the load balancer function in AWS can cover it? No, so you don't need to create uh, any EC2 instance to become a load balancer, right? So you don't need to do that. What you will do simply is uh, come here and create a load balancer right here. All right, and uh, once you have a load balancer, you simply specify the uh, EC2 instances uh, that it needs to distribute traffic to. All right. Uh, so, so Lakshmi, your question is: While creating a virtual server, is there any option to select the number of network cards? So, no, you know there is uh, there is no option right now. But uh, uh, 
uh, I mean, no, no option by default, as you, as you saw in the screens, right? There was no option there. But uh, there is uh, there is something called ENI, Elastic Network Interface, and you should also look up Virtual Private Cloud. Right? So this is this is essentially a, a sort of a virtual network that you create within uh, AWS, and you can have servers installed within uh, within a VPC. All right. So there, you do have options of assigning multiple uh, sort of IP addresses to a, to a certain instance, right? So you have to look up the documentation, uh, but, but it's not a straightforward uh, selection of network cards uh, in the EC2 launch screens. All right, Sindhura, your question is, can you talk a bit about subnets and what's the difference between a subnet and a security group? All right, so, so security group is essentially a firewall, right? Uh, it's a firewall. And uh, what you can do is uh, you can create any number of security groups, say uh, one, one firewall for the web server layer, right? So you may have 10 web servers, and all of them are protected by, a same, by the same firewall, right? And, uh, and a, a web server firewall will allow traffic on port 80 and block everything else, all right? You may have a security group for a database layer, right? And there you'll allow traffic. Uh, on port 3306, which is a MySQL port, let's say, right? And you'll also allow traffic only from the web server or application service, not from anywhere else. So, so that's that. Security groups are firewalls, right? And a subnet is uh, is a network subnet, right? So, so um, I mean, for example, at home you might have a subnet which which has a number like 192.168.2.x, right? And in the same network, you may have another subnet called 192.168.1.x, right? So, so essentially, you have a network, and within a network, you can have subnets, like more one or more subnets. So, subnet is essentially a networking concept, uh, right? So, it's a set of IP addresses. Um, all right. So, for example, a, a subnet can have 250, 256 IP addresses, right? So, that's that's what a subnet is and security group is a, is a firewall. All right, and Nagendra, your question is, can we independently upgrade or downgrade only the RAM of the instance? No, so what you can do is you can uh, change the instance type, uh, right? So, so when you change the instance type, uh, you do change the RAM, all right? You do change the RAM, but in some cases, you may also change the, uh, you may also change the CPUs, right? So for example, here, you can change the instance type, right? Uh, right now the server is running, so it, it's uh, grayed out. But if the server is stopped, you can change the instance type and uh, just look at the documentation for uh, what are the resources for each instance type, right? So, um, so that's how you have to do it. You can't simply produce the RAM. You can you have to change the whole uh, instance type. All right, uh, Gaurav, is there an option for database for database replication? So yeah, so you know with RDS, right? With RDS, you can do database replication uh, using the multi-AZ deployment option, all right? Um, but you know, remember, EC2 is just a virtual server, right? So if you're doing database replication uh, on two servers, right, on your own, uh, whatever you can do outside of AWS, you can do on AWS, all right? So uh, you can take two EC2 instances, uh, make one a primary and, and the other a slave server, right? So all those things are possible. All right, so uh, Dohun, your question is, how do we create other servers uh, which, which have the same specification and configuration as the existing one? Yeah, so this is also a very good question. Uh, all right, so what you do normally, uh, Dohun, is you, you have an instance, right, like this one, and you connect to it, you install your server, right? You, you create your, you install your application, you install all the packages that you need, right? You may need PHP, you may need MySQL, you may need Apache, for example, right? So you install all of that, and then um, once once the server is is installed, tested, right? What you do is you simply simply come here and you create an image. All right. So uh, with this image, this becomes an army essentially, right? And then you can use this image to create as many servers as you want, and uh, those other servers will be exactly the same uh, as uh, as uh, this one. All right, so this is something that's very common, right? This is something that you have to do, um, and of course, there's a, there's a way to do it. All right, so do we have, uh, Gaurav, your question is, do we have intrusion prevention like firewall and anti-malware services running to protect the applications? So, of course, you have firewalls, right? So the security group that we saw here, right, you can see here as well, this is a firewall. 
all right and you can create uh, uh, multiple firewalls you know multi multiple layers of firewalls for example one for your web servers one for your application servers one for your uh, database servers all right you can create your infrastructure within a virtual private cloud uh, all right and you also have access control lists so so there's like another firewall at a networking level as well all right so that's i mean from a security point of view uh, and a networking point of view this uh, aws has a lot right um, it has a lot of uh, capabilities uh, but as far as malware is uh, concerned uh, those are things i think that you have to install right so if you're installing some malware protection uh, type of uh, software uh, on your existing servers you can do that you can do that on ec2 servers as well right so remember ec2 and aws servers are exactly the same as uh, servers running in your own uh, data centers, right? So you can do the same thing here as well. All right, and Sriram, you're saying uh, in the main panel you saw application gateway. So let me just take a look here. Oh, API gateway maybe, right? So you you probably mean API gateway. So this is essentially you know a service which lets you publish certain APIs, right? So you create your APIs. Uh, those APIs could be uh, sort of simple, for example, Lambda functions. Right? So you can create a small program uh, using Lambda. And then publish it via the via the API gateway, right? So it sort of gives you a managed uh, gateway service for your APIs, right? So you don't have to sort of uh, uh, provision for for APIs, all right? So so good for things like web services, right, or REST APIs that you may want to create, all right? So uh, guys, I think that's the uh, that's the set of questions I'm seeing right now. So I think we can end the session. I hope uh, I hope you learned something. You found this uh, useful. All right. So thank you very much for joining.